That's really, uh, it's great messages from Governor Newsom and thank you, thank you to him for taking the time to share his perspectives. We're all watching the different climate actions and policies that are coming out of the US and particularly California in light of the Inflation Reduction Act. We'll hear more about this from our first keynote speaker, Jeffrey Pyatt, the US, US Assistant Secretary of State and Energy Resources just shortly. So for those of you, you might not notice, we're running a little bit late, but the conversations have been riveting, so you probably haven't checked your phone or your watch a hundred times. <laughs> we're about half an hour late, so we are going to cut the break that you saw on your agenda. So what does that mean for you in the room? Don't rush for coffee all at once. It's going to be here all through the day. You can make your way up there if you need. Uh, and for those of you at home, please feel free to stretch. Um, and, and we are going to proceed to our next conversation. En attendant, n'oubliez pas de partager votre expérience de la conférence et d'identifier l'Institut climatique du Canada et le groupe consultatif pour la carboneutralité. Donc, j'aimerais inviter maintenant M. Peter Nicholson, président du conseil d'administration de l'Institut climatique du Canada, à venir nous adresser quelques mots et à présenter notre prochain conférencier. Well, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Look, it's my pleasure, and I, I, I won't extend the time that is already slipping away from us, uh, but it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our keynote speaker, Ambassador uh, Jeffrey Pyatt, who, uh, as, uh, as we just learned, is also the, currently the Assistant Secretary uh, for Energy Resources at the U.S. Department of State. Uh, Ambassador Pyatt uh, is a native Californian, uh, Seems to be the California as a theme at this moment. Um, uh, he's a Yale graduate and has had a really distinguished career uh, with the U.S. State Department, including uh, ambassador to Ukraine uh, from 2013 to 2016, uh, and most recently, uh, ambassador, U.S. ambassador to Greece uh, until just last year. Uh, his foreign service career. Uh, has included postings in India, Pakistan, Hong Kong, as uh, well as a stint with the National Security Council uh, in the United States. Uh, so clearly, Ambassador Pyatt has a penchant for being where the action is, and he tells me that he is here fresh from a, <laughs> a testy exchange with the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, I believe, last night. And, uh, Perhaps we'll, uh, we'll find this audience to uh, not pose quite the challenge that he experienced just less than 24 hours ago. So, Ambassador Pyatt, uh, welcome and take the stage. Thank you very much, Peter. And, and let me start by saying what a thrill it is to be back here in Canada for my first visit in my capacity as Assistant Secretary of State for Energy Resources. And, and special thanks to the Net Zero Advisory Body and the Canadian Climate Institute for giving me this terrific lead-in uh, with my governor, uh, Governor Newsom. Um, as Peter said, I, I grew up in Southern California. I still count it as home. It's where my parents and my kids live. And it's been really exciting for me to see what the energy transition looks like every time I go back to my home state. I was in Silicon Valley uh, just two weeks ago, and it was remarkable to see then both the, the, the forging of linkages between the tech sector and the energy transition sector that's such an important part of the Silicon Valley ecosystem right now, the way venture capitalists and others are starting to look at energy transition as driving the same kind of opportunities that they have seen over the past decades in the tech sector, but also how fast the energy landscape is, is changing. And Governor Newsom talked about that a little bit, but you see the new headquarters of um, our hydrogen companies. I visited laboratories at Stanford that were working on innovative battery chemistries, and pretty much every Amazon delivery truck that I saw was a Rivian. So you really see how the energy transition is happening. You also see up close and personal the impact of the climate crisis. And I was sharing with Peter earlier some of my impressions from my six years in Greece, during which I saw horrific wildfires, flooding, 
Um, the change in the sea temperature in the Mediterranean, which is seeing some of the most extreme variation anywhere in the world. And it's a real reminder that the world is, is flashing a yellow light to all of us, that we need to tackle this climate challenge as fast and, and with as, the greatest urgency that we can muster. I'm also here in Canada because this is a really unique relationship in terms of the issues that I am responsible for. Of course, we have the world's most comprehensive trading relationship. But what not everybody knows is that Canada also is the United States' largest energy trading partner. We have robust clean energy ties. We have deeply integrated energy infrastructure systems. But we're also working more and more together around all of the issues that are at the cutting edge of the energy transition, whether carbon sequestration, clean hydrogen, critical minerals and supply chains. So there's just an awful lot for us in government to do. Uh, but we also share the fundamental understanding that ultimately what is going to define the success of the energy transition is the work of our private sectors and the, the choices of our citizens. This is really an unprecedented time in the global energy picture. Uh, you have the convergence of multiple crises, the impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and Putin's weaponization of his energy resources, but also the demands of the climate crisis and the opportunities. And again, I, I come back to my, my impressions uh, from, from California just recently. Um, we have long been able to count on Canada as an ally and a like-minded partner on so many issues, and, and of course climate is, is part of that. And so. I want to start by expressing appreciation for Canada's action and leadership, both the public and the private sectors, addressing the climate crisis. But this is not just a matter of, of federal governments continuing to work together, as, as we are doing every single day, but also what happens region to region and the way our companies and our private sectors work together and what our citizens are doing together. A big part of the story in the United States, of course, as has been alluded to, is the Inflation Reduction Act, but also the bipartisan infrastructure law, together mobilizing um, more than a half trillion dollars uh, that is really supercharging the energy transition in the United States. The IRA is, quite simply, the most important and most ambitious climate legislation in our country's history, um, and it is going to produce a dramatic change both in our ability to meet our Paris climate targets, but also the way uh, the American um, energy ecosystem is organized. We're seeing already how the Inflation Reduction Act is changing uh, the calculus of our companies and, and the catalyst that is, it is providing for huge new investments in clean hydrogen. Um, in the, uh, the, the in, in innovation across the carbon sequestration space. We just celebrated the one-year anniversary of the Inflation Reduction Act last August. Since then, um, our private sector has announced about $110 billion in new clean energy manufacturing, which is creating jobs and opportunities across the U.S. economy. But given the interconnected character of the North American economy, it's inevitably going to bring benefits here in Canada as well, and that's one of the things that I'll be talking about with government today. Um, one, is, one other issue that's a particular focus of my government engagements today, and I'll just spend a minute on this, is, is the question of critical minerals. Because as much as we want to drive the transformation of our energy systems, our transportation systems, that's going to mean that the world needs exponential growth in the volume of cobalt, lithium, nickel, zinc, copper, uh, graphite um, that our industries have available. We want to make sure that those commodities are produced in a way that meets the expectations of our communities, that upholds the high ESGs that our citizens are going to demand, and we want to break the near monopoly that China has across too many of these supply chains today. For the State Department, our signature initiative to tackle this challenge is something called the Mineral Security Partnership, um, an organization that brings together 14 governments. Uh, Canada was a founding partner in the MSP and has been a very strong participant. The idea of the MSP is to bring our governments and our private sectors together to mobilize our diplomatic power, 
but also our state finance institutions, our trade finance organizations, in order to identify projects around the world which will help to create opportunity and drive the availability of resources that I talked about while meeting the high ESGs that we have embraced publicly uh, through the ESG principles that the MSP partners have all signed up to. Um, we greatly appreciate Canada's strong participation in this exercise, and one of the things I'll be talking about today is how we can continue to leverage this as a mechanism to identify opportunities, to bring our governments together, and to drive the growth in what our industry is doing in a pace that is faster than what the market alone will produce, because we are trying to meet the challenge of the climate crisis. So let me stop there and hand it over to Sean. I think we're going to have a conversation now. But what I would like to leave you with is a combination of the sense of ambition and, and optimism that Governor Newsom conveyed so effectively in his message, but also a sense of the United States governments, of the Biden administration's profound commitment to our special partnership with Canada on these issues. We have a very long history of collaboration um, between, our, between our energy industries. Now we're going to have to take that collaboration and move it into all of these new spaces, including the issues around electric vehicles that were the topic of the panel before mine. So again, thank you to, uh, to, the, to our hosts, and I really look forward to the conversation. Thanks, Sean. Well, uh, thank you, Ambassador Pyatt, for those remarks. Um, it's, uh, I, I know the audience here is interested in uh, what's happening in the United States, um, both as it relates to Canada's economy, but I think as importantly, how it re relates to the way we think and talk about climate change uh, and the energy transition. Um, we don't just have a, a two-way relationship when it comes to trade, we have a two-way relationship when it comes to ideas. Um, and I think what is happening in the United States uh, is, is of great interest uh, to those who are committed to making progress on climate change and the energy transition, which in a way leads me to my first question. Um, I think one of the things that struck a lot of Canadian policymakers and, and those um, adjacent to the world of public policy is how quickly American public policy has shifted from what was perceived as a disinterest in climate policy to now carrying out the highly ambitious plan that you talked about earlier. Um, what happened? Uh, how has Washington come to reconceptualize climate policy and the energy transition? Now, well, thank you, and it's a, it's a really good question. I mean, obviously one thing that happened is that Joe Biden became president of the United States, and President Biden's, one of his first actions coming into office was to bring us back into the, the Paris Climate Accord and to really push across the administration, including in my bureaucracy in, in the State Department, um, to have us think more ambitiously about how we are going to meet the obligations that we've undertaken as part of the Paris Climate Accords. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act was obviously a big part of that. Uh, I will say, I was, I was back in Washington for my Senate confirmation process when the IRA was passed. Yes. And um, I'm not sure if it was clear looking down from Ottawa, but in many ways, I mean, this was an unlikely accomplishment. People didn't know literally until the night of the final vote that the politics were all going to line up and yes. this was going to happen. Um, and, and I think it is you know, arguably um, one of President Biden's most important single accomplishments of, of this term. Um, but I think what's interesting to me also is, is you look around American domestic politics a lot of what I talked about in my remarks, what um, Governor Newsom talked about in his, is becoming the conventional wisdom in American politics. I, I had the opportunity this summer to be up in Anchorage in Alaska for the first time, like a lot of Americans, you know, terribly ignorant about our, our 50th state. Um, but I was talking to Governor Dunleavy, who is a Republican, uh, but he was extremely focused both on the implications that climate change has for Alaskans, yes. uh, you know, a, a, a community that is deeply rooted in the land and in nature, but also the opportunities around clean hydrogen, around critical minerals, about how to produce those minerals in a way 
that meets the demands of local communities, uh, but also delivers a lot more of all of those energy minerals that I talked about earlier. So I really think there's been a, a change in the conversation there. You know, the, a couple of months ago, there was a terrific three-part series in the New York Times, which talked about energy transition domestically in the United States. And the big takeaway was this is happening a lot faster than people understand, that out in American communities, energy transition is, is, is real, and it's being driven, and I, I appreciated the, word, the, the Slido word cloud at the end of the last presentation. The first issue there was cost. You know, that's what consumers care about. And, and a lot of, these, um, a lot of the, the technologies behind energy transition are now delivering power at a cost that is at par, if not better, than what the fossil energy ecosystem was able to produce. And I'm optimistic that that cost advantage is actually going to accelerate because of the scaling that the IRA is producing, but also because of what I saw when I was in these laboratories at Stanford, all the innovation that's attracting to this sector right now. Uh, let's stay on this line of discussion for a minute, because as an outsider, it seems to me part of this evolution involves a, a shift in mindset from a defensive or a zero-sum way of, of thinking about climate change and the energy transition to a more positive zone, one rooted in, as you said, opportunity. Um, before we came on stage, you mentioned um, the geographic distribution of those opportunities. You know, that is to say um, that the benefits of the RRA to up till now have been broadly distributed, including in a lot of red states um, and rural communities and deindustrialized communities and so on. Do you want to just talk a bit about um, the geographic opportunity um, or the, maybe put differently, the opportunity to support investment and job creation in, in, in parts of our countries um, that have experienced challenges over the past, say, quarter century or so. Right. So the United States, like Canada, a big continental country, um, you always worry about economic and social disparities, and there are people who worry about getting left behind. But what's interesting, if you look, for instance, at the investment that's happening in the United States in new solar manufacturing facilities, and new battery manufacturing facilities. A lot of that is actually happening in the South. It's happening in states like, like Georgia and, and South Carolina for a whole lot of complicated domestic macroeconomic reasons. But I was also sharing with you, I, I love to tell my foreign audiences when I'm traveling abroad, I ask them, what's the biggest wind power state in the United States? And I know it's not true about Canadians, but most foreigners, their idea of Texas comes from the Dallas TV show. Yes. And, and so when you tell them that Texas is our biggest wind power state, they're sort of surprised. Yeah. And, and, and also, if we look at the, the revolution that's happening with carbon sequestration and clean hydrogen, a lot of the biggest development of that industry is happening on the Gulf Coast, because that's where you have the legacy gray hydrogen industry and, and the, the quickest climate gain is going to come from taking that gray hydrogen industry and making it clean. So this is, and, and I think that's on us as, as, as political leaders to help tell that story, um, but then also be quite intentional about the social aspects of this, yeah. that, that we have to make sure that communities that have been disadvantaged in the past are not left behind. Again, the mining industry brings a lot of this to the surface and is, is a really important part of the conversations I'll be having with government today. But it's also true in other industrial sectors. And we saw some of it rippling in the United States in the, in the auto workers strike that we've just gotten through. Um, you mentioned in your remarks uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and Vladimir Putin's weaponization of, of his energy resources, uh, which was well said. Um, those developments, of course, have led to new thinking and questions about energy security and its interaction with our climate goal and overall trade policy. Uh, how does energy security fit in the U.S. government's policy? Is there a trade-off year here, and how do you think about possibly balancing energy security with such an ambitious climate agenda? Yeah, really important question. Let me start with the first principle, which is energy is a national security issue. And we have seen that over and over again. And certainly the way in which Putin manipulated energy in the run up to the invasion of Ukraine sort of answered that question for once and all. So we want to be really careful uh, that we don't 
have an era of European dependence on Russian fossil energy become a new era of collective dependence or vulnerability to Chinese control of clean technology supply chains, whether it's solar cells or wind turbines or battery minerals. Um, so we need to work on that aspect of it. I think it's also incentivized, and that national security focus incentivizes us to work really, really hard on the energy transition because the most secure energy of all is energy which comes from geothermal or wind or solar. And then I should spend just a second on the, the, the nuclear issue as, as well. And, and I should note, I had the opportunity to join your Deputy Prime Minister Freeland at the White House for the last meeting of the US-Canada uh, Clean Energy Task Force. There were two issues that we focused on in that setting. Um, one was critical minerals, I've talked about that. The other was civil nuclear. Hmm. Because we have highly integrated civil nuclear interests, um, we have work to do in the United States. I was, in my appearance before the Senate yesterday, I was asked by Senator Risch of Idaho about this issue. The United States still gets about a fifth of our nuclear fuel, the, the enriched uranium, comes from, from Russia. President Biden has asked for $2.2 billion to help kickstart a revolving fund that will, will revive the U.S. enrichment industry. Hmm. Um, this is also linked to another very important issue for both of our, our countries, which is the future of nuclear power. And, and um, of course, very proud of the fact that, that here in Ontario, we're going to have one of North America's first small modular reactors, the GE Hitachi project. Um, the United States has made a very strong commitment to SMR technology. And, my DOE colleagues tell me we now have about 20 companies that are working in this SMR space. Some of them are going to fail along the way, but some of them are going to be able to innovate and roll this out. Um, but we are also committed um, to working to zero out our dependence on Russian nuclear fuel. So then there's a natural synergy as well with Chemico. Um, not to mention the, the, the evolving, and I have not gotten into the details of this, but the evolving um, commercial relationship between Cameco and, and Westinghouse. So we have a uniquely integrated civil nuclear power sector. Um, nuclear, I don't know the statistic for Canada, it's about 20% of the U.S. energy mix. We will not meet our Paris climate targets without a strong nuclear industry. So we have a huge stake collectively in the secure, securing a reliable nuclear fuel supply, developing the new technologies that are part of a small reactor supply chain, and then figuring out how we build these things a lot faster than the decade or more, which has been the, the standard tempo of late. If I may stay on the subject of our bilateral relationship, I, I noted in your remarks you talk not merely about the relationship between our two national governments, but also opportunities to expand regional um, partnerships. As a Canadian, there's a, a natural appeal to that. The, the, the relationship is less asymmetrical at the subnational level. Um, I think, generally speaking, state governments have not experienced the same type of dysfunction that we've seen in Washington. Um, I just ask you to, to elaborate a bit on the idea of expanding the relationship at the subnational level to support the overall trans energy transition and climate objectives of our national governments? So I, I think Governor Newsom's remarks are the best illustration of that. I mean, we have states that are really thinking very ambitiously about their outward personality. Yes. In fact, Governor Newsom's deputy is a dear friend of mine, Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis, and she has been given the responsibility of sort of running California's foreign policy. Now, our constitutional drafters might have some problems with that <laughs> idea, um, but that's very much, I think, how Californians are thinking about it. And a lot, again, back to the idea that we're both these giant, you know, east-west oriented countries. Yes. So when I go to Vancouver, it feels a lot more like home than when I come to, to Ottawa. Yes. And so the, the issues that communities are concerned about, um, the opportunities for industrial integration, and, and again, I think you know, recognizing that a foundational aspect of the U.S.-Canada um, economic alliance is the auto pact, yes, and, and the fact that the that auto industry is geographically concentrated. There's an interesting challenge because of how EVs are scrambling the marketplace. Um, that you have Rivian out in Southern California, you have. 
Um, you have Tesla in Southern California, and then you have a battery industry which has this extraordinary appetite. And I, I know my boss, Secretary Blinken, was up in Canada a couple of months ago. He had the opportunity to meet, to visit a lithium recycling company here in Canada, um, which is invested by General Motors. So you see, and again, the previous panel talked about this more effectively than I can, but huge growth in demand for these industrial products that are part of an EV supply chain. Um, so there are natural synergies there. And then the other one that I would flag, the other supply chain issue that has loomed large in my world recently is, uh, is wind turbines, uh, and in particular offshore wind, which is a big part of the Biden administration's vision uh, for the future. The industry is going through a sort of valley of death of the development cycle right now. Um, but there's no question that there are terrific possibilities here. And, and Canada, of course, like the United States, is a member of APEC. We're going to have all of our leaders in, in, uh, in San Francisco in a couple of days. But it's also a very much, again, my Vancouver lens, very much a, a Pacific-oriented country. Yes. Um, that's true in your energy sector with, with, uh, with Canada LNG. But I also have to assume that the same kind of opportunities that exist for industrial collaboration between Japan, Korea, and the West Coast of the United States also apply to Canada in areas like offshore wind, cabling, batteries, all of the things that we're going to require at a much larger and, and faster scale in order to meet our climate targets. And I guess I would, I would flag that as, as one of the biggest preoccupations I have yep. about this energy transition right now, that the pacing factor in North America is no longer political will, to go back to your first question. Yes. It's no longer policy choice, it's supply chains. It's how quickly we can manufacture this stuff and how our companies can find ways to short circuit that process and become more effective and do it in a way that creates jobs and opportunity at home and doesn't just ship all this stuff off to China. I'll, I'll ask you about the supply chains in a minute, but I'd be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to make a plug for a, a recent public policy paper by the Canadian Climate Institute's chair, Peter Nicholson, on the subject of uh, wind and the potential opportunities for Canada that I'd encourage people uh, to read. Another thing I'd encourage people to read is a set of remarks that you delivered in March in Bulgaria, uh, where you talked about security supply, not merely of energy, but also inputs like uh, critical minerals. You, you touched on it in your remarks, but I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you to elaborate a bit on what the U.S. government is doing um, to mitigate the risks to, to supply, um, both with respect to new energy sources, but also critical minerals. So the, the most important thing we're doing is working with allies and partners. And, and you know, I talked about President Biden and his commitment to the Paris Climate Accords, but I would also put a really strong spotlight on the Biden administration's commitment to our alliance relationships. And it's very clear that we can't do what the IRA is seeking to accomplish uh, without working with allies and partners around the world. And again, I start for the fundamental principle that we have no more robust trade and economic relationship on the globe than the one with Canada. So it's really important that we work together on these issues, whether it's nuclear supply chains or critical mineral supply chains or solar or batteries. Um, I, I think we also need to figure out how we think together about the, the China challenge and de-risking there. Um, national security, my, our national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, talks about a small yard with a high fence because China's not gonna go away and we don't want it to go away. It's, we want it to remain embedded in the global economy, but we have to figure out what are those critical technologies and critical sectors that we need to protect and, and how do we build a regime to accomplish that. It, it was really easy in the, in the Cold War era. We had COCOM and all of these other structures because we knew who the bad guys were and who the good guys uh, were. Yes. Um, it's a lot more gray now. So uh, the work that we do government to government to, to tackle that issue is, is really fundamental as well. Um, I started our conversation by observing that a lot of Canadians have been struck by the major progress on US climate policy. They are also, however, unsure about its dur durability in light of various factors, including but not limited to politics. Uh, I won't ask you to weigh into politics, of course, 
But talk about the extent to which America's ingenuity and economic might is now focused on decarbonization in a way that transcends politics. So I, the first thing, again, I come back to my conversation with Governor Dunleavy. I had a similar conversation um, last year at COP27 with the governor of Indiana, another Republican state. And, and all he wanted to discuss with me was how we were going to work with international partners to attract more wind turbine manufacturing to the state of Indiana, the opportunities in Indiana for carbon sequestration, where Indiana was going to fit in a new North American, and I, I say North American, not American, um, green hydrogen network. So I think that's a big part of the story, um, that this has become a driver of prosperity and opportunity in a way that's going to be very hard to reverse. I, I think the other aspect of it is the reality of the climate crisis. You know, look domestically at the United States. Um, take an example again from home. My parents, um, they are no longer, they had to switch their um, homeowner's insurance policy because they live off of a canyon and their insurance carrier would no longer absorb the risk of a wildfire sweeping through the neighborhood. Uh, we see the same thing in Florida with beachfront property. So uh, the climate crisis does not obey blue-red political maps, yes, and, and I think communities around the U.S. are feeling that. The other thing I would put a spotlight on, and especially as we get ready for COP28 and all the work that we will do there, is um, in the United States, as in Canada, we have this political tension because we, have, we both have national leaderships that are deeply committed to energy transition and climate policies, but we also have tens of thousands of people who earn their living working in the fossil fuel industry. And so figuring out how we, and, and, and markets around the world, in the case of the United States, we are now the world's largest LNG exporter. We're going to have that status for years to come. 70% um, of U.S. LNG last year went to Europe, and that American LNG played a central role in helping to provide energy security to our European allies as they got themselves off of Russian pipeline gas. So the challenge is how do we produce those molecules in a way that is as least climate damaging as possible, which means working very, very hard on things like methane abatement, monitoring of fugitive gases, following the science in, in terms of what we can learn about um, the production cycle of these, these fossil fuels, and then also really pushing the envelope as the Inflation Reduction Act does on carbon sequestration. And, and I think there too, there's an enormous North American synergy that's likely to emerge. And I'm, I'm hopeful on, on this visit, is learning a little more about the political geography of Canada on these issues, as I, as I talked about earlier. America's political geography on these issues is a little bit more intricate than you might predict looking from outside. But it, what's, what's absolutely clear to me is that how the United States and Canada work together on these issues, whether it's through the Mineral Security Partnership or through the integration of our civil nuclear industries or how we think together about the China challenge, is going to be the sort of basic building block of the larger international coalition that the United States and the Biden administration is trying to build to meet our climate and energy security goals. Well, Ambassador Pai, that's a, a good point to wrap up. And let me just say on behalf of everyone here, um, uh, we're grateful that you've, you've joined us, um, notwithstanding the weather. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I know everyone here is grateful um, uh, the interactions that you have with government officials to, today to continue to advance a, a kind of continental agenda around the energy transition and climate change. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thanks.